Hello, and welcome to another episode of the SIRS Group Podcast. I am Barbara. And I'm JC. And today we have a special guest. Christian is here. Yay. Hi. <laughs> welcome, Christian. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, JC. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, oh. we're excited to have you. Sorry, go ahead, JC. No, I was going to say the honor is all ours. Um, if anyone is unaware of who Christian is, Christian is at SIRS Lab on Instagram. He is the rock star of the SIRS group community, always jumping in to answer people's questions. We couldn't appreciate you more, but I definitely want to give you the floor to introduce yourself and um, tell people what sort of resources you can help them with when it comes to SIRS. Yeah, thanks, JC. Um, so in terms of resources as you mentioned uh, we have the search lab platform on instagram this is where you're going to find uh, all of the educational content regarding SIRS and like you guys really um, search lab is an attempt to provide a space where people can learn about the scientific basis of the illness in a manner that is relatively accessible and at the same time i want to use this space to provide information that ties into more generally scientific information discoveries that have implications for chronic illness at large. Um, and in addition to that, or within the SIRS lab platform, um, I'm, I'm doing a series of online workshops uh, specifically targeted to help SIRS patients with aspects of treatment that tend to be confusing or overwhelming, or that simply do not get covered in enough detail. And we have one upcoming on, the, on July 9th, so feel free to check that out on the Instagram page for more information on how to sign up for the workshop and feel free to uh, message me. And uh, lastly, I'm also offering one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions for those who are trying to heal from SIRS. And um, you know I'm, that's something that I'm happy to explore if you're, uh, with you if you're interested. Uh, most of the people that I work with are working with a medical practitioner doing the Shoemaker protocol. But you know the reality is that sometimes uh, people need a helping hand to guide them along uh, the protocol with treatment steps and testing, and especially when it comes to managing exposure. So these are things that I, I try to guide um, people, especially at the early stages of the treatment. So yeah, so that's uh, my little um, promo. Um, and I'm happy to introduce myself more like personally, if that's okay. Yeah, please, please do. do. Yeah, so... Um, Okay, so professionally speaking, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Georgetown University in DC. And for those of you who don't know what a postdoc is, so that's the abbreviation for postdoctoral researcher. It's basically an intermediate step in an academic research track, right in between the PhD and a full-time faculty position. So if you're someone who's doing research and you're thinking about staying in academia and do more research, a postdoc is a great way um, to become more specialized in a research area, acquire new skills with new methods, you get more scientific publications and build your resume. And ultimately, all of this prepares you for a tenure track faculty position, which is its own roller coaster to try to get like one of these faculty positions, but you do your best and hope that something will pull through. Um, in addition to that, I'm, I'm a SIRS patient. Uh, I was diagnosed about a year ago, and since then I've been on the Shoemaker protocol um, somewhere along the last steps of the protocol. Uh, and I was about to start officially VIP very soon, but my practitioner was, I would say, wise enough to have me do some additional testing in my current living space to make sure everything is okay to do that. Um, yeah, so I've had many events throughout my life that most likely contributed to the onset of, uh, of SIRS. Um, but yeah, I, I think we think it fully become manifested somewhere in 2020, right around the pandemic. And that's what I call the sort of point of no return. Um, and just to give you an idea of how things have changed in my life, in, in a span of a year, I went from being an extremely active person physically and cognitively very high functioning to a person who dropped 50 pounds all the way down to 100 pounds, no tolerance for food, supplements, or even water, no energy, slurring speech, neuropathy, severe anxiety, I ultimately ended up in a wheelchair for a month um, doing things that I shouldn't have been doing uh, in terms of treatment. Uh, but thankfully, I've been able to, I would probably say, reverse 
almost all of these symptoms thanks to the Shoemaker protocol. Um, I've gained some weight. Um, a lot of my sort of blood markers have begun to normalize. Autoimmune issues um, seem to be um, out of the picture. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to lay that out um, uh, in terms of you know my personal uh, story as a service patient. And uh, I mean, I can say, I don't know if you guys want, I don't have to, but I can talk very briefly about the research that I do and maybe how that could tie into SIRS. Oh, I'm fascinated. Yeah, you have yes. to say it now. <laughs> okay. So um, so going back to my academic career, really my research has no inherent connection to SIRS. And a lot of people ask me this, but ever since I was di diagnosed with SIRS and I started reading the published scientific literature, it opened up uh, new doorways to start thinking about ways in which I could integrate my research training with SIRS and biotoxin illnesses. And just to give you an example, uh, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist with training in linguistics. So I study the brain networks and the cognitive processes that are associated with language. That's sort of my niche. So our ability to produce words and sentences, our ability to comprehend other people speaking or when we're reading, the kinds of processes that are involved in that. More specifically, I study bilingual populations. So bilingualism is sort of the, you know, a big, big focus on my research. And so I'm really interested in this question of how is it that the brain changes in response to the use of more than one language? And it turns out that it does change in very profound ways, which is really exciting. And one of the reasons this is exciting, or this is an exciting question is because we have found that lifelong bilingual experience is associated with a five-year delay with the onset of symptoms for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, in mainstream neuroscience and psychology, we don't have, and I'm gonna put aside uh, an asterisk to this because we have now SIRS on the radar and BIP, but as putting that aside in mainstream um, neuroscience and psychology, we really don't have any known drug that induces this kind of effect in this type of patient population. So this is a huge frontier of research right now. And we're trying to figure out how is this possible? And really, we, we have no clue. We have no idea. Like, I mean, we have some ideas. I'm exaggerating a little bit. We have some ideas of what's happening. And we think it has to do with the idea that bilingual experience is changing some of the brain networks that regulate our ability to control our thoughts, our attention, our behavior. Um, and we think some of these changes have neuroprotective effects against cognitive decline and some forms of neurodegenerative disease. What's really cool is that some of the brain regions that change because of bilingualism are also brain regions that become affected in SIRS, um, which I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about. Um, so this, is, this raises an interesting question of whether we see some inherent neuroprotection from this illness by virtue of being a bilingual speaker. And this is really a question like looking like way into the future. I don't think we're ready to like really like people to take on it, um, but it is something that I'm really interested in figuring out ways to integrate SIRS into my research program. And this happens to be a really cool way to do that. So yeah, this so that's a little wild. bit of the background. I know, I have <laughs> goosebumps. I have, wait, I have really? a question. I yeah. have a chicken and egg question maybe. So to me, there are people who are just so naturally gifted at learning languages and it just seems so easy for them. And those people aren't just bilingual. They know like five, right? Wait, Christian, how many languages do you know? Me? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm a Spanish native speaker. So I, I was born in Puerto Rico and Spanish is my native language. Um, although I acquired English very early on and I, I started learning German when I was in college and I went to a study abroad program in Vienna when I was an undergrad, one of the best like, experiences of my life. Um, so that's about it. I, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and my German is not as full been able to practice it. Um, but you know, one really cool thing is that ever since I've been improving, I've been able to have occasional dreams with German, which was very rare. It had happened sometimes. And usually it's like a, these very logical dreams, super like logical, rational. And that tends to happen with second languages. Um, and there's some really cool research with second language uh, and like emotionality and how affect is manifested in your second language. Anyways, a segue, but it, it ties in. So good, I, good yeah. use of affected as well. But uh, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, sorry. That was a random inside joke that I don't know why I said out loud. Um, I cannot tell the difference between effect and effect. And so I only ever say impact. And Barbara's yeah. making fun of me right now. And no I am one not else making knows. fun of I think I it right. <laughs> no, anyway, no, but my question is like, okay, is that, do you know yet if a brain is just wired correctly from birth to be like, are some people just naturally gifted towards learning languages or do the brain changes happen because you are determined to learn more languages and you just fight through the difficulty? And then you, if you do learn multiple languages, your brain changes in the same way. That was a terribly worded question. No, 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 that's, that's okay. perfectly, that's perfectly worded. Um, that's a really good question. It's like literally one of the big million dollar questions that's been okay. haunting the research for like the last four or five decades of research. And the question, the answer is probably a combination of uh, nature and nurture. So, you know, we would suspect that there are people who have, like anything, like any skill, you know, using a language is a skill and, you know, becoming bilingual is a skill. There are skills involved in that. And there are brain regions that allow you to sort of hone in into these skills and tune in into them. And, and we know that there are individual differences just by virtue of, you know, your biology that sort of give you more aptitude, more, you know, easily more uh, potential to pick up on things more easily. Maybe you're really good at picking patterns um, in the environment and that can translate well to learning a second language. Maybe you're really good at tone discrimination. So if you're learning something like Mandarin where there's a lot of tone involved, you know, uh, fun, you know sounds, uh, being able to discriminate acoustics and parse them really well. And there's actually really good research showing that there's this part of the brain called the brainstem that actually literally mimics like auditory signals, literally, if you record that part of the brain, and let's say you're playing a song, you can um, pull out that signal and play it. And it will like, it's like a buffered version of the sound. And we know that yeah. that part of the brain is predictive of how well, how successful you are at learning like a new language. And part of that is going to be biological, but, uh, but we think that there's also contributions from experience. And what, what are the conditions in which you're put to, you know, to adapt to learning to a second language. And that's where we actually, a lot of the research that I do and, and colleagues of mine, that's where we're at. We're trying to figure out what is the role of experience and optimizing that. So, that's yeah. wild. That is so cool. And amazing. we could spend the entire episode talking about this and not even touch SIRS, but that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but looping back to what you were saying about the the brain and how there, there are changes that happen, um, one of the tools we can use when we are diagnosing SIRS, and when I say we, I mean SIRS practitioners, but we as patients can have this cool tool called the NeuroQuant. Um, so we should start by talking about what is SIRS, and I always say the same little bit about what SIRS is. So I would love to hear your definition of SIRS. Um, I mean, my definition is probably, you know, just packaged a little bit different, but it's the same idea, right? It's a multi-symptom, multi-symptom illness that stems from an inappropriate immune response to the presence of these things that we call biotoxins. And, you know, these are small dead fragments that are produced by living organisms and most often found in the interior of water damage spaces, but can also be found in, you know, tick-borne illnesses like Lyme, fish, fish toxins, algae blooms, spider bites, and now even COVID, it seems. It's the big um, uh, black sheep in the room. Or did I say that right? Black sheep, elephant in the room? Elephant, um, sure. Elephant, yeah. Multiple animals. To, it's the whole I zoo think, in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I th you know, I think the other day I said black elephant in the room, and I, I think this was my non-nativeness kicking in. Uh, so I blended in the idea of the sheep and the elephant in the room. And, um, <laughs> the person who listened to it was laughing. But you know, yeah, no, I it. love it. Um, <laughs> and OK, so, yeah, so there's a genetic basis for this inappropriate immune response. Right. And we think it's about 20 to 25 percent of the population that has this genetic susceptibility. And in plain English, if I had to sort of summarize this, right, it's part of our immune system seems to have a hard time dealing with some of these biotoxins. Maybe it's like one biotoxin or a very few subset when they enter our bodies initially. And so this is, you know, part of what we call the adaptive immune system 
which is the one that creates antibodies when we get sick or get vaccinated. And it's not good to have a faulty adaptive immune response to any foreign invader, but certainly biotoxins, because biotoxins have the capacity to disrupt cellular functioning in potentially serious ways down the line. Um, so there are compelling reasons for the immune system to rid itself from these biotoxins and remove them from the body safely. But there's another part of the immune system called the innate immune system that sees this threat. Um, and all it can do is essentially spread bullets imprecisely all over the place in an attempt to attack the biotoxin, um, but also along the way attacking our own tissues. And so this results in systemic chronic inflammation throughout parts of the central nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. So that's what central nervous system means. Um, over time, right, this immune response becomes just too much, too dysregulated. The body loses resiliency, which I think is a really important concept in SIRS, is really about losing resiliency, um, meaning that the chronic inflammation reaches a point where virtually many major systems in the human body are altered in sort of a indefinite sense. And we start seeing all kinds of things like digest digestive disorders, a lot of leaky gut, dysbiosis, SIBO, SIBO IBS, um, hormonal imbalances, cardiovascular abnormalities, um, metabolic deficiencies, and ultimately we see loss of cognitive function and brain abnormalities, often in the form of brain atrophy, meaning that your brain starts to literally dry out and shrink in size, which is perhaps the scariest part of this illness, if you think Terrifying. about it. Yes. And, you know, because we think that eventually this leads down the path of vascular dementia and um, Alzheimer's. Um, or some people are calling it type 3 diabetes, and they're making this link with this specific form of diabetes and, and Alzheimer's. And so we need more research, but it would, you know, the picture is emerging to kind of suggest that this is the sort of the long um, term sort of, or one possible outcome down the line, you know, further down the line, if you don't get treated. And one way to measure that level of brain damage, let's call it, uh, to be as dramatic as possible is a neuroquant, right? Yeah. So, yes. so tell us what is a neuroquant for all of the wonderful folks who are like, what the heck, what kind of MRI? Yep. Yep. So the neuroquant is essentially an analytical brain imaging tool. So it's an add-on software program that allows us to quantify brain abnormalities using an MRI brain scan. Okay. So we can look at structural, um, uh, indices of your of your brain. Um, essentially, right, so Neuroquant is taking a picture of your brain, and what it does is it compares that, that picture to a template, like some kind of generic template that reflects the brain of an average healthy person of your age. So this template comes from scanning thousands of people with healthy brains, and so you kind of come up with this aggregated version that reflects that. And this way, we can quantify the extent to which the structure of specific brain regions deviate from those healthy brains, either in the form of swelling or enlargement. So brain regions kind of, you know, just, yeah, becoming enlarged. We call it um, hypertrophy. That's kind of like the fancy name. Or on the opposite end, because of atrophy, which is right shrinkage. Um, so we can measure that. And NeuroQuant is an FDA approved test. It was officially developed to diagnose Alzheimer's, which is right, a type of dementia, but it's now being used to diagnose and monitor the progression of other types of dementia, epilepsies, multiple sclerosis, mild cognitive impairment, and I think traumatic brain injuries in there. And of course now SIRS is one of those. And the cool thing about the neuroquine is it's been shown to be just as reliable as traditional radiologist reports where they look, you know, these people are trained to look at these brain scans and figure out if there's any abnormalities. In some cases, the neuroquine has been shown to even be more reliable than the traditional approach at detecting significant brain abnormalities. Um, and like I said, a radiologist relies on visual inspection and it can take many hours, sometimes up to a hundred hours for you know, and sometimes multiple radiologists to do the full inspection of the of the scan. Mm -hmm. um, the the neuroquan, on the other hand, only takes about ten minutes, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So within twenty four hours, 
your doctor may have the final report available. It usually takes a couple of days if um, you know, to get the report. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had that experience or has it taken longer to get the report? You know, we do have, so I haven't had a neuroquant done, um, yeah. but I, we do have a member that has, and her process was um, a bit of a mess. So she has like a cautionary tale. Um, a doctor told her just to go get it done and didn't really give her direction on where or how. And so when she went to get it done, she told the technician, I need to get a neuroquant. And that technician was like, uh-huh. And then did it. And turns out only an MRI was done, not a neuroquant. So she actually had to go back. So there were two separate 15 minute ish sessions that she ended up doing. And now she's still struggling with getting that report over to her doctor. So I think um, if you're, if you're working with a uh, SERS practitioner, definitely, I think a, a good uh, thing to ask for is a referral to a place that the doctor's familiar with as far as like where they can get it done and that they have a relationship with that if possible. I know location makes that really hard. Um, but there's, or you may also want to ask what format the doctor needs it in. So if you need to be that intermediary, intermediary, like uh, getting one thing from one place to another, then you at least know what to ask for and what to look for. So I think those are some of the struggles that we've seen as far as getting the report to the right person. We'll also, in the yeah. show notes, we'll go ahead and link um, the official surviving mold map of where you can get the neuroquant. So it's tried and tested through those locations if you kind of want to take the easy road. I would take the easy road. Oh, perfect. Yes, that'll be great. And uh, a question that I have about the um, the neuroquant itself, is it going to help? I've heard that it helps um, diagnose whether your biotoxin is mold versus Lyme, but is it also going to get as specific with like actinos and endos in that direction? Or is it really just more of a mold versus Lyme kind of diagnosis? Currently, uh, formally, what's, you know, available in general is sort of this distinction between figuring out whether you're suffering from SIRS due to water damage exposure. And it's been traditionally called mold. Chances are that within that you have, you know, all these other toxins from actino and endotoxins. Right. Um, and then differentiating that from a Lyme infection. Um, there's, yeah, and you're, you're touching on this really cool feature of the neuroquan that it allows us to pick up on pattern, brain, patterns of brain abnormalities that are unique to each of those. And this is not just coming from the work by Dr. Shoemaker and his colleagues. There's this work outside that group, especially, particularly with the Lyme, I'm, I'm talking about the Lyme um, studies where they, they have, there's research showing what the signatures are for, for the, for Lyme. And just, you know, to kind of wrap up on the, on the uh, neuroquant in terms of its usage and at a very general sense, but there's studies that have used neuroquant where they find patients who have um, small, you know, a small hippocampus, which is a part of your brain that's really important in memory and learning and memory integration and things like that. And, you know, with Neuroquan, we have the ab ability to say, for example, look, uh, people who uh, have a small hippocampus are four times more likely to progress into Alzheimer's disease in a few years compared to people with a relatively normal size. So these are the kinds of things that the neuroquant allows us to, to track and measure at a very, very general level. And it's been very useful in that regard for SIRS because of the quantitative power. I was going to say, I'm going to start using, you have a tiny hippocampus as a new insult to people. <laughs> <laughs> your, your hippocampus must be so That should be like a shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, we do need we, SIRS group uh, merch, so I think <laughs> this is like one of those really cool ones. But Christian, I guess, did you want to touch on any of the other? How is it used to diagnose, help treat, or how the biotoxins differ? Yeah, because we kind of talked about the Lyme versus mold. Uh, uh, briefly, the scoring system, because there's a scoring system based off of you know how do we determine you know whether you are suffering from SIRS or not. Um, and what I'll say starting is that, right, this is a tool that can be included alongside the, the sort of SIRS blood panel that we all typically do. 
but it can also be used as a standalone diagnostic tool. It's, it's that powerful that, you know, you could, um, let's say for some reason you don't have access to the blood work and the neuroquant is the option that you have. Maybe your insurance covers it um, because it does it typically insurances do cover the neuroquant um, and prices do vary. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of different you know, prices. Uh, so you could do that, but ideally you want to have both of these tests and also throw in the genie if you have the resources to do so. Um, and just really quickly, the genie yeah. is the genetic testing to help you understand which genes have been turned on by SIRS. It can also help indicate what you are reacting to. So the big thing right now is actinos. Everyone is talking about actinomyces and they're finding more and more on the genie that a lot of people, that's what the biotoxin they're reacting to is. Yes. And I don't know this research off the top of my head right now, but I do know there are, uh, you know, there's research looking at associations between gene markers and the neural quants. And there are patterns of association there that are really interesting of markers predicting changes in, uh, in uh, volumetric changes in specific brain regions, which is really cool to see that. And I, I love to see more of that research. Anyways, um, so how is the actual diagnosis made in neural quant? Well, it turns out that in SIRS, like we alluded to, there's a very specific pattern of brain abnormalities that develop over time as part of the body's abnormal response to biotoxins. And this pattern turns out to be different from the brain abnormalities that we see in other illnesses, such as Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, it's really interesting to, to pick up that there's these very subtle but systematic patterns, uh, diff uh, different patterns. And what's fascinating is that, like we said, we can even tell whether the patient is suffering from SIRS due to water damage exposure, um, which is the most common form of SIRS, or due to Lyme disease, which if I'm right, and you can you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, it's typically the second most common form of SIRS, perhaps. Or you could have both of these. Yeah, that sounds right. Sorry. Oh, that sounds I would right, say, right? But I think COVID now is like this, it's a dark oh. horse. I'm going to name another animal. It's a dark horse <laughs> coming in from behind. <laughs> I would say most yeah. recently I've seen more and more COVID. Historically, you know, before 2020, it would have yep. definitely been like. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think that's a really good point. And I, I think the number, you know, it would be great to get some numbers on this because it's probably going to be overwhelmingly, you know, I don't know what the number is going to pan out, but it, it certainly can be higher than Lyme. So, wow. That's quite a reconfiguration of the landscape, and I'm hoping we can keep up with that as we move forward. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, right. There, there turns out a group of SIRS practitioners who are highly engaged on the research front came up with a scoring system that's based off essentially six volume, volumetric measures across different parts of the brain that are included in the NeuroQuant report. So, these measures. Um, I'm not using the word brain regions because some of them are brain regions and some of them are aggregates of different brain regions. So for example, the forebrain and cortical gray, these are not specific, or it, it, they are specific brain, re specific brain regions, but they're more like measures that include a variety of sort of more specific brain regions. And so they are aggregate measures. Um, and that's sort of... Um, factored it into the, the, the score for, for SIRS. And then we have four more specific brain regions, the caudate nucleus, the pallidum, the uh, putamen. I actually struggle saying these because I have conflict from my Spanish, um, where I want to say it in one way, that some of these brain regions, um, maybe it's the Latin also. So we have those three, and then the, the thalamus. So we end up with a total of six, um, um, brain measures and they're split, um, you know, by hemisphere. So we can look at the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So actually, we end up with double uh, uh, of that. And the and the basic idea is that you get these volumetric numbers, so numbers of your volume from each of these six brain measures. And if those numbers fall below or above a certain range, that's considered normal you get these sort of assigned points. So in this context, getting a score or a point actually means worse, not better. 
in the context of making that diagnosis for sure. It's like golf, right? Like yeah, golf. exactly. I was yeah, going to so make you're... that come. I, we <laughs> both wanted to make a sports reference. Someone write this day down. <laughs> it's like barely a sport, though. So I don't know if that counts. Oh, I'm just pissing off the golf oh, no. people. Oh, no. It's like I'm the only sport person. my boyfriend plays. So he'll be pissed about this. That's fine. Oh, I've God. played <laughs> mini golf. I have as well. You know, I ha- I I I'm a very like historically I played like basketball, soccer, like a lot of sports, and I never I never played golf, and I feel like maybe now it's a good time to try something like that. Um, I don't know. I don't It'll, know. How oh, Sir Zex, we should go play mini golf one night. Oh, that would be fascinating. Yes, mini golf to- and golf are two very different things, though. We should say. Well, I definitely want to do mini golf. Okay. What, golf. <laughs> what do you call the one where you just like? you know like beating the you know just just shooting like as far as as you can oh Uh, driving driving range driving range okay none of us are qualified to talk about this topic and it's (laughs) (laughs) this is the most uncomfortable golfing podcast ever anyone who plays golf is just screaming (laughs) play it right i'm sorry golf community but it's okay We'll, we'll try to make up for it by making maybe a teacher uh a joke about golf (laughs) I mean, there's probably some limbic retraining that happens when you're like learning how to play golf for the first time, because I can't hit the ball. I don't know how people take a a giant swing at a ball that's there on the ground and not just smack the ground or fully miss it. That's all I ever do. I mean, have you you tried, you know, I mean, we're not done with treatment, but it would be good to to give it a shot post VIP because some of these brain regions might help you. With that coordination. Maybe that's um, why. That's the that's been the problem my whole life. Now I know. The VCS test. Let's just golf. Yes. Golf. Yes. Yeah. Might be a better um, match. All um, right. Well, I'm glad I'm glad we took that tangent. Um. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so just to wrap up this, um uh, you know, for patients who are, are suffering from surge due to water damage, uh, they typically are going to have a score of five or higher when you aggregate these points that I just mentioned, the golf points, um, across four of the brain measures. So these are like the four brain and the cortical gray measures and then the, the caudate and the pallidum. Um, but for patients who are mainly suffering from surge due to Lyme, they're going to have uh, a different score in, 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 in the other... Uh, two brain regions, the putamen and the thalamus. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, if you have those numbers, you can get a diagnosis for SIRS right there and then essentially, which is really cool. There's more to the neural form, but this is sort of the gist of how it works for SIRS. And who can read the neuroquant? That would be the SIRS practi- the SIRS slash Lyme practitioner, right? That's who would need to interpret it for you and give yeah. you that score? Yes. That's the, that's the, the, yeah, the, the appropriate person. You could do um, the math yourself. There are, I'm not sure. Oh, not with SIRS brain. Math. Yeah, not with SIRS brain. I, oh, I SIRS brain. Okay, I'm not, in, I'm not recommending you do this. I, I, I right. don't want your brain to be, you know, protected from doing hardcore math. But, but there, there are ways of doing it if you wanted to go for the challenge and, and push your brain. Um, but yeah, your practitioner is the designated person. Uh, when it comes to the search uh, index score, of course, if you're looking at the neurocorn more generally, and there's other information that I might, might talk about it a, a little bit further, where a neurolog, uh, you know, a well-trained neurologist can also help you sort of look into it. But a lot of the changes that undergo in SIRS are very subtle, um, which is actually something that I think scientifically we're changed. We're still at a very premature stage where we don't really appreciate the the impact of you know low grade chronic changes to the body but also certainly to the brain and nervous system and i think this the 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 surf base score is really sort of like a very um it's it's like a very uh it's an amazing but also preliminary way of starting to develop measures that capture more subtle you know abnormalities in the in the brain and I, I just don't think in general in the mainstream science we've developed sensitivity to that enough so if you go to a neurologist 
um, they may miss some of this just because they they don't have the right framing to think about. It's not that they're not good, but they just don't have the, the, the right training or framing to think about these subtle brain abnormalities. And this is something that's showing up also a lot in the concussion literature where there's, you know, if you have like a very tra classic big concussion, traumatic brain injury, there are very clear markers, but there are people who have very low grade damage and those are not being picked up very easily by sort of the, a lot of the medical community. And that's something that's actively being researched a lot um, and mm -hmm. hopefully it'll get better in the next decade or so. So we've used the terms tiny hippocampus, abnormal brain trauma, brain damage. You know, these are like, we've been accused before of trying to like fear monger people into getting SIRS treatment. And I think that First of all, that's not what we're trying to do. We are trying to be very realistic. And if you do not treat this, there is long-term downstream impact. But I think the coolest part of the neuroquant is what they find if you get it at the start of your treatment and at the end of your treatment. So can you tell us a little bit about what kind of changes people might expect to see in the neuroquant after they go through the Shoemaker protocol? Yeah, this is, I yes, I'm glad that we're talking about this because this is really where the magic happens. Um, well, at a very general glance, right? So if you, if you get a neuroquant before treatment or somewhere along the early stages of treatment, things might look a little bit um, not so positive. You can use abnormal. Glance. We've been saying Ab abnormal. Okay, abnormal. <laughs> it might look depressing. but and, and this is the thing about this illness, that this illness will throw you in the, you will hit rock bottom at some point, And it could be like something that you, you're like, this is unbelievable. And then from there, you can make the biggest leap into amazingness um, in your life. And a lot of it has to do with what's happening with your brain. Um, you know, having your brain back and what this treatment does to you is just incredible. But, you know, at a very general level, the expectation is that this, for instance, the SERS index score should improve with treatment. And um, along the way, you are going to start or you should start seeing changes in uh, something called the percentile scores um, that you get in the neuroquant report. So, right. So let's say you have like a fifth percentile score for your hippocampus. That means that, um, right, that you, your, your volume scores um, or 90, uh, your scores are below 95% of sort of the rest of the population, which is another fancy way of saying you have an atrophy brain that's very, very atrophy. And ideally, what you want is those percentile scores to start hitting the 50th percentile range, which is the median, which is essentially where the normal healthy brain sort of lies. And so that's something you want to be on the lookout um, with the neural quant as you're doing the treatment, especially once you hit the last step of treatment with VIP, which is vasoactive intestinal peptide. It's a neuropeptide where really, once you start that treatment, that's where we start seeing some remarkable changes in brain structure. Um, and to add to that, what we see in the brain of these patients is nothing like I've seen in any research out there looking at interventions that can induce neuroplasticity. I talked a little bit about, you know, the bilingualism part, but we don't really know how to quantify that. And we don't know what the parameters are. We're not like actively, you know, experiment inducing people to become bilingual. This is just sort of a natural thing. But if we had a treatment protocol where we like give, you know, a tr intervention design where we had some people do some kind of intervention, they take some drug or something like that. We don't have anything that looks anything remotely like what we see with, with the changes in brain ab abnormalities due to this treatment. And just to put it in the context for the audience, just how much of a miracle uh, this treatment is. Um, so, the, you know, if we go back to neuroquan, one of the things that uh, has been shown is, the so if thinking about Alzheimer's disease, um, and looking at the hippocampus, which is a brain region that atrophies severely and before you even get diagnosed with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. So once you start showing those signs in, in the neuroquant, you're at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so what some research has shown is that, uh, you know, in healthy patients, the brain shrinks about 1% per year. That's like a very 
rough estimate um, of starting just at normal. what age? Um, I mean, usually you start declining somewhere after your thirties, and so oh, this nice. is like a very gross. Great. Yeah, you 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 tend to peak. I mean, initially it was thought that in the twenties. I think more recent research is sort of saying, well, there might be like a cognitive peak all the way up until like the mid thirties or something like that. Um, there's yeah, a lot of debate I'm about peaking, it, but just so you know, this is the best you'll ever have. Of <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> it's hey, all downhill from here. Been... <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I feel like the jury's still out because there's a lot we don't, there's some, I mean, we can talk about, you know, what are we doing lifestyle wise that's contributing to that 1% drop. But in any case, compared to that 1% in an Alzheimer's uh, brain, you see about a 5% um, decrease per, per year. So you have these different rates of change. So in terms of decline and loss of brain structure. Now, okay, let's go back, let's bring that back to SIRS. So Dr. Shoemaker published a paper in 2017, I think it was in 2017, where he and a group of his colleagues look at changes in the neuroquant following treatment with BIP. And if I remember correctly, they had different groups of people who, who, who had done like a short version of BIP and then a longer version, which I think it was something like 12 weeks or, or longer. And without going into gory details, what they found is that compared to the baseline before VIP treatment, a high dose regimen of VIP improved volumes of the hippocampus, the putamen, and the pallidum by, I think it was roughly 62%. Oh, damn. Which is insane. Um, and I think it was something along the lines of 77% improvement for the thalamus. And this is, I mean, uh, I don't think they have like a, you know, it's we can assume that it's roughly within a period of a few months of high dose VIP, right? So now you're thinking about, and I mean, this is a very preliminary story. I do want to sort of put it in context. We do need more research, but it's still nevertheless, it's insane. Let's say that these numbers are somewhat inflated because that can happen with statistics. Let's say the number is 20% instead of 62%. That's still a huge number, statistically so speaking. Right. So and we don't have effects like that in neuroscience and intervention treatments. Um, we, we so, you know, we see things like PTSD, which is, by the way, strongly associated with atrophy in the amygdala. Um, and it's, you, you know, this is from research uh, outside the, the SIRS community. But there's research, again, outside the search research community showing that VIP um can improve anxiety and depression, can improve volumetric markers of the amygdala, and can improve dramatically PTSD symptoms. And in some cases, it complete it can completely disappear. Wow. Uh, right. I so, didn't know any of this. Now I want a neuroquant, like right yeah. now. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, right. You might want to look into the amygdala if you're dealing with uh, right. a lot of severe anxiety. And this is something that happens actually, at, especially at early stages of SIRS, there are these brain changes that take place. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more, but I, you know, we don't have to. But yeah, these are the kinds of changes um, uh, that you would expect. And essentially, it translates to people functioning like normal people reacting to, to stressful situations like normal people. So Here's another thing I want to say about this that's really, really cool about what VIP is doing to the brain. This is like, it blew my mind when I came into this idea. What VIP is doing to your brain is essentially removing memory traces of the stimulus that initially initiated the chronic inflammatory response to a biotoxin. That's wow. essentially what's happening at the neural level in terms of neurons. It's wiping out the memory traces of that event, which are the, the events that are making us stay stuck in this state of excessive innate immune activity, and then poor deficient metabolism, which are the two states where, you know, we're kind of tugging, we're this constant tug of war, and the body cannot get rid of that. And VIP has the capacity to, to reset that by literally just wiping out the, the sort of the hard disk. And that's what allows us to build tolerance. And as and as you start removing that information, um, that's when the brain starts, you know, if you have atrophy, brain regions start growing back up. So you have that sort of phenomenon. It's really the way that I think about it, at least, is the brain that, you know, all these networks and brain regions now feel like the threat is no longer there. So it's safe to go back to sort of 
normal, right? Like the storm has passed. So that's like a very poetic set way of thinking about it, but that's that's what we think it's happening at a very deep level, which is something that I I think I feel like it's coming out of a sci-fi movie. Um, but it is our reality as patients once we undergo this treatment protocol. Well, that's amazing. Well, I I really appreciate you sharing that. And that that's it blows my mind. Sixty two percent, seventy percent. Like you said, it could be inflated, but even still, if you're looking at brain atrophy in one to five percent ranges and five percent being Alzheimer's to have something over five is insane so yes SIRS patients give off tiny amygdala energy but shoemaker protocol you can regain a lot of that brain volume it sounds like that's amazing what one thing I do want to add to that and I don't want to I don't want to ruin the mood because we're such at a high peak but but there is some nuance to this which is the measure that we call volume um brain volume it's a it's a composite measure of two other measures of your brain and these are what we call um cortical thickness and we and so uh and then the other measure is called surface area so these are sort of different ways to measure brain structure. And this distinction is really quickly of cortical thickness and surface area is really important because cortical thickness can reflect changes in dendrites, which are these little branches coming out of your neurons that are the ones that sort of, they can sort of change in terms of length. And, and the axon is another one, which is this really big uh, uh, branch that can make new connections with other neurons. Um, and, and so they can change in terms of branching out to make new connections, but they can also undergo pruning, which means that dendrites are shrinking in length. So that's one possible source of brain atrophy that's driving you know, the, the volumetric changes in your neuroquant. But then there's the other measure that I mentioned, surface area, um, which reflects a different thing. It reflects what we call folding or gyrification. So your brain is not just growing outwards. It's actually like folding itself. And you can kind of see that in pictures often. And so larger brains tend to have more foldings. And, and so when we're measuring volume, we're measuring a combination of both of these things. And so why I'm bringing this up is because your atrophy could be due to either Changes in pruning, which means your dendrites are kind of like receding, or it could be neuronal death, which the uh, fancy term is apoptosis, which means neurons are literally dying. And those are different processes, and they can both contribute to atrophy. So one thing that the neuroquant can kind of tell us which of these is playing a role in your brain is seeing what kind of progression do you see with treatment. Um, you would expect the most success with VIP if most of your atrophy is coming from, you know, dendritic or pruning, from pruning processes, that's the most neuroplastic sort of phenomenon that you would expect. If it's surface area, so if it's coming from the death of neurons, um, that's, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's not impossible. You can still have neuroplasticity, but it's much more constrained. So you would expect either a longer time to see sort of levels going back to normal or it would just be a little bit harder maybe you have to do a little bit more maybe you have to think about other treatments past the shoemaker protocol to keep stimulating sort of the brain stem cell therapy would actually be at the forefront of this of inducing that kind of neuroplasticity anyways this might be a lot of too much detail but i feel like it's a really it can be an one way to think about how you recover from this illness from a neurophysiological perspective and I think that was an important nuance to cover. And now we can also add smooth brain to our list of insults because um, we need more wrinkles. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm done. I'm done. Wrinkly brains, yep. <laughs> They're the way to go, wrinkly brains. So yeah. uh, good stuff. Yeah. Well, Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you share again where people can find more info from you? Yes. So um, again, uh, we have the social media platform on Instagram called the SIRS Lab. Um, and you can find us there. And we have tons of educational content in there that we put regularly uh, regarding sort of, you know, 
uh, recovery from SIRS, learning more about the scientific and medical basis of SIRS. So make sure to you know uh, follow us in there. Um, and as part of sort of the, the, the educational content that, that I'm trying to provide in different sort of mediums, we're doing these online uh, workshops uh, to talk about uh, different aspects of the treatment protocol with SIRS that can be a little bit overwhelming or daunting for SIRS patients when they're doing it on their own. So the workshops that I'm doing, um, that I'm trying to do and that I'll continue to be doing in the future are sort of designed to try to help patients to give additional information about how to, you know, how to deal with these kinds of challenging situations as you're doing the the, the shoemaker protocol. And we have one that's coming up on uh, the 9th, uh, July 9th. Um, the information is on the SIRS Lab Instagram uh, website. And feel free to uh, DM me personally if you want to also, you know, coordinate or talk about that. And I'm also offering coaching sessions one-on-one -on -one with patients who are either thinking about the shoe doing the shoemaker protocol or who are actively doing the shoemaker protocol in order to heal from SIRS. Sometimes um, people need a helping hand along the way, you know, along working with their practitioner. Uh, uh, sometimes they just don't have all the information that they need in order to sort of be guided on a day-to-day -day basis with the treatment. And so this is an area that I'm, I'm helping people as best as I can uh, as, a, as a patient and hopefully get more people uh, on track to heal and to be able to tell their story of SIRS. As best as he can. He's a walking dictionary of SIRS. Exactly. And we'll go ahead and leave all of your info down below. Sorry, Barbara. Yes. No, I was just going to say that. We'll have all the links uh, in the show notes. And if you are not a member of the SIRS group yet, well, you would have access to Mr. Christian and us. We're cool too, I guess. Wait, but... wait. If, if you're not a member of the SIRS group yet, you're giving tiny hippocampus energy. We can see your smooth brain from here. Uh, all right. Let me try that again. Guys, you should join the SIRS group. Uh, if you haven't already, because if you are in the SIRS group, you would have access to the awesome Mr. Christian, uh, who is a Dr. Uh, Christian. Dr. Christian. Dr. I'm, Christian. I can't I still feel weird about that. I will I'm call him up Dr. Left Christian. and right. No, anyone who gets a doctorate needs to be able. No, I feel terrible. Now, JC, I've just like canceled myself on doing this outro. Go ahead and take over from here because I can't do it. I wasn't going to stop you. I just no, wanted to please. interject. No, it needs to be stopped. If you have not joined the SIRS group yet, what in the world? You are giving tiny hippocampus energy. You are giving small, smooth brain energy. If you want to join us over there and um, get more insight from Dr. Christian Navarro Torres, you can do so by joining the SIRS group.com. And we'll see you in our next episode. See you then. See ya.